Hello everyone and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for the virtual launch of Three Bodies, that's this book over here by Nakama Brody. I'm Mandy Wiener, <laughs> that's Nakama over there, maybe there. Um, <laughs> I'm Mandy Wiener, I'm a journalist and an author and an avid uh, book reader as uh, my Oh, did you go away? I'm back. There we go. I I'm went back. away. There's nothing more where did important. You, where did you go? Somebody's trying to phone me, I think, because <laughs> they want to know if they should send their kids back to school. But I'm back. Right. So anyway, as I was saying, I'm Mandy Wiener. I'm a journalist and an author and a very keen book reader. And uh, today we are, um, this is the virtual launch of Nakama Brody's Three Bodies. Um, so we're going to start with a conversation for about 20 minutes. Uh, and then we'll take some Q&A from the audience. So just a reminder that we won't be able to hear you if you want to speak to us. But there is a function at the bottom of your screen, which is a Q&A function and a chat function. So you can post your questions there and I will then put them to, to Nakama. So um, if you want to ask her anything, we can't hear you, but you can post them there. And also just a reminder that uh, virtual and physical bookstores are now open. Uh, you can get the ebook on Amazon Kindle or on Kobo uh, and also Uber Eats, which is just like the most amazing thing that if you order your dinner, you can order uh, Nahama's book at the same time. And also Pam McMillan, the publisher, will post the links in the chat and we'll also get, uh, you'll get an email tomorrow with a link and the recording and all the details to buy your copy. So if you want to go get the book, that's the way to do it. So now for those of you who don't know Nahama, she is easily one of the most fascinating and multifaceted people that I know. Um, she's a part-time alt folk musician, is that right? Is that what you call yourself? A martial yeah, artist. Yes, um, but slack a slack at the moment. A, a second dan in karate, a boxer, all of the above. Um, and also she wrote two books at the same time. She wrote a book on femicide while she was writing this one and got her doctorate. Just, you know, in case anybody wanted to feel like an underachiever. Um, so uh, well done, firstly, Nakama, for writing this book. <laughs> Thank you. So Three Bodies is a book about water spirits in Hart Beer's Poet. Um, it's about cash and transit robbers. It's about acid mine water damage. It's about the inadequacies of the police and the legacy uh, problems of the police. And also, as uh, Pamela Motena says, um, it is also about the biases, prejudices, and racism in, in our country. So it's a lot in, in one book. Um, this is the follow up to Knucklebone. Nakama, how did you come yeah. up with this plot line of mermaids in how to be a sport in cash and transit problems? Um, when, I was, when I was working on Knucklebone, I was consulting with um, the, the, one of several Isangomas that I later um, started to work with and who helped re review my text. Um, and at one of our, our consultations, um, the discussion sort of came up and I, I don't know how I asked the question, but she mentioned that there were mermaids trapped in the how to be sport dam. And that sort of really stuck with me because, and I understand this is a, a difficult thing for many people to get their heads around because not everybody is uh, part of the same belief system. But, um, you know, as I always kind of joke, we, we belong to, I mean, the kind of largest global religion has some pretty uh, far-fetched um, events happening in itself. So, you know, if, if you believe in the things that are written in the Bible, then, you know, believing perhaps that there could be water spirits trapped in the dam might not be that far-fetched for some. And um, when I started to talk to the Sangoma again about why these um, spirits, which are often feminine entities, might be trapped, what would be the point of, of trapping some kind of a magical entity? She just looked at me and she said, well, you'd need it for battle magic. And at that point, started looking at cash and transit heist. But the thread of what was three bodies, um, you, you mentioned that I kind of wrote two books at the same time and so I'm often juggling multiple projects. And when we sold Knucklebone, um, the, the, my agent at the time said to me, well, do you have a sequel to this? Because, you know, it's useful to have a sequel to sell. And I was like, yeah, of just, course just I've got a sequel. In your, in your back pocket, you know. I like, was like, no, of course. And I, I literally, yeah. and I sat there and I was like, I need to come up with an idea really quickly. And I was like, oh yeah, those mermaids and I'm going to use that. And then I came up with this idea um, and what, what was somehow captured my imagination at the time was the, the water hyacinth at the heart of your sport dam. 
that just covers the surface of the dam. Mm. And it's this incredibly invasive, but also quite pretty um, invasive water flower that then completely crowds out all the local vegetation, kills the fish, um, chokes up the dam. And for me, that was just the most brilliant metaphor. And so I was like, yeah, here's, here's this idea for, for the second book. Um, and then two years later, I had to write it, which was a bit tricky. So I've, I've seen your, your books being described as fast-paced occult noir. Is that an accurate description? Um, okay, so let's, let's start at the back part. The occult noir, um, I think, is something that uh, globally we, we see in other, in other writing, but I think has a special place in um, African fiction and mm. um, African speculative fiction in particular, because there is, quite, I think, inherently in societies here, um, a lot of belief in what many other people would call superstition or the occult um, or things like that, but um, are really just part of everyday life here. Um, and so to write books without acknowledging that there is a large, um, not a shadow, because that always makes it sound dark. It's not necessarily always dark. But when you're writing noir that's set in Africa, um, it's not just about corruption. It's also about sort of taking into a place the people and the place that you're writing from. And, and so I think that um, African fiction, particularly African thrillers and African speculative fiction, occult noir, noir and, and noir in general is like the perfect genre for that. In terms of the fast paced of things, um, you mentioned the sort of martial arts stuff that I do. And if yeah. anybody from my class was watching right now, they'd know I haven't really been training much during lockdown. Um, and I have the best intentions, but it's not happening really. Don't we have the best intentions about everything in lockdown? And, exactly. You know, so I'm, I'm really yeah. trying my best here, but, and I'm missing it. But I do like to understand the art of fighting, all right? And so I would like to say I like to understand the art of fighting more than to fight necessarily myself, although obviously I want to be prepared to fight. And so I'm always very, very interested in the actual pace and the movements of scenes and how you get from one space to the next. And sometimes, unfortunately, I get bogged down in geography, so I literally drive from one place to the next. But with, but with fight scenes and with action scenes, it's incredibly exciting for me because I really visualize it all in my head. Um, so yeah, the fast paced stuff, I hope is accurate because I think it's quite pacey. Um, yeah, I would definitely agree that it's, it's super pacey. Um, so your, your books are very layered and they're very textured. They examine um, topical current affairs issues. So knuckle bone, it was animal poaching. Um, in, in three bodies, it's uh, cash and transit heist, acid mine water. That's obviously in, intentional. How do you choose the issues and, and why? So I think, again, the, um, when you're writing crime in South Africa, and you know this, is all of those elements are actually always part of the story. They may not be the main part of the story, but when you start digging into it, the landscape is also part of how a crime takes place. Um, and when you start talking about landscape, you also inevitably in Johannesburg in particular, there's always a layer of environmental uh, interest, um, whether that's poaching or the damage that the mines have done um, or environmental degradation, people not looking after environmental areas. And, and I think we see that across South Africa where you can't tell a story that's set in a place without at least acknowledging those realities. And the same, I think, looks at issues of apartheid. Uh, and again, it might not be the focus of your thread, but it's always there because it's part of everyday life. So for me, um, an environmental backstory is always part of what's going on. Um, and, uh, and again, when, when you're in South Africa, the, the current affairs that seep in day to day, I mean, like your stories, the stories that you write about actual crimes and criminals, they tell us about criminals don't emerge out of a vacuum. Yeah. They're produced very much by the society that they come from and they prey on the society that they operate in. So they're quite specific. They're almost a bit like a virus, you know, where they're designed to be very effective in a specific space. And so part of the interesting thing for me is to really understand what makes that space so fragile and so vulnerable. So how much did you rely on actual newspaper reports or, or something like Annalisa Burgess's book heist for, for the accuracy and the intricacies of, of organized crime? So um, I work, well, I used to work as a fact checker, but I still work in research and accuracy is very important up until a point. The nice thing about novels, as I hope we will one day get you to participate in, is that you get to make up stuff. So there's, you know, at, we both know that fact, fact is definitely stranger than fiction. Fact is so much stranger than fiction. So what you're looking for when you're writing a novel for me is plausibility. 
right? Rather than absolute accuracy, you know, the, the millimeter number of the gun that you're using or whatever, but you want it to be plausible. So it should have the feeling of, of, of um, veracity. And to get that, you need to actually read, see, and, you know, hopefully not experience, but actual accounts of this. So as soon as I knew that this book was taking a turn towards cash and transit heists, because originally there was going to be some other stuff going on. It was going to be a lot more environmental. What, 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 what other stuff? It was going to be a lot more. In, so, okay, this is where fact checking ruins your plots, right? So when I started to plot out this book, originally I wanted to talk about acid mine water drainage and water um, degradation and pollution in the Hardebier Sport Dam. And I was going to link that to water systems, but trying to link the drain off from the mines into the Hardebier Sport through the river systems that we have is quite complex. And, and then also didn't kind of feed back to the water spirit story. And it's not really battle magic. So as soon as battle magic came up, I was like, cash and transit, that's, that's the thing. And then I started yeah. researching cash and transit heists. And I turned uh, to a number of different sources. The, the one primary source, which was amazing, was a book by a, another journalist, Annelies Burgess, who uh, worked on special assignment for many years and um, is still an excellent journalist and editor and wrote this completely compelling detailed and brilliant investigation into cash and transit heists in South Africa. It's called Heist. Um, and it's, it's, if you like true crime, it's fantastically well done. It explains so many aspects of it. And also what I liked about it was she really went into the layers. So she didn't just focus on the crimes themselves. She also looked at the people behind them and the people who were researching them. And she explained um, not only the crooks, but the cops and all these layers that the cops had to put in place to protect themselves while they were investigating these cases. And then what I did together with Annalisa's work was she also referred to a number of academic research papers, which I went and found. Um, so there is academic research, for example, looking into the relationship between um, cash and transit robbers and uh, magic or their interest in the work of Sangomas, because many of the, the crooks will go to a Sangoma beforehand and get some kind of an item or get a blessing or something that they hope will make them invulnerable or less vulnerable, impervious to bullets. Um, and this is consistent. Um, I mean, across for the many years that these types of heists have been happening. Um, I also watched a number of videos. There's quite, you know, social media and the internet has changed a lot because you can find, well, a, a long list of actual footage of cash and transit heists as they're happening and as they're finishing. And this comes from CCTV cameras on petrol station forecourts. It comes from passers by. It comes from, you know, th there's footage of people in cars where they're filming while they're reversing. And reversing okay? yeah. I'm like, guy, get out of there first. Um, you know, I'm grateful for the footage because it helped me research, but just leave and, and what you can hear. And this is an interesting thing um, when you research true crime is that it's not really like the movies. So when you watch a video of a cash and transit heist, there's no Nicolas Cage and there's no grand explosion. What you often hear is quite strange. It's like little pops. It's like little mm. pops, like fireworks. Gunshots are not big pops. So you'll see this car reversing or whatever, and you'll have this pop, 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 pop in the background. And when you see it, it's like, it's actually terrifying when you think about what's going on there um, and the amount of ammunition that just gets sprayed all over the show. So, so a lot of video footage, um, Annalise's book, uh, I went through media reports about cash and transit heists to try and see who were the key players that were involved, how were they reported on, how were the scenes described. Um, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned, um, and we joked about fact versus fiction, and you, obviously you have got a, a background as a fact checker. Um, and you really are obsessed with facts. I mean, like, there's no denying it. So I'm fascinated by the fact that you, you did write a factual book on femicide, but yet you love and are so good at writing fiction. What, what is the appeal for you? I mean, facts tell us only so much of the story. And, you know, when I teach fact checking, I also explain to journalists that fact checking is very important, but we can't have news reports that are only facts because otherwise nobody would read it. Literally, our, our news reports would just be columns of figures um, or information. And our job as journalists is to be accurate, but also to give context to that accuracy. And so there's a limit as to how much facts alone can tell you a story. You have to also be able to um, give it context and uh, explain what those facts mean, link them to other facts, link them to people, because often it's about a human experience. Um, I mean, you must know what it's like. My, my two children hate the fact that I'm a fact checker because every time they ask me something, I have an answer and they're like, mom, I wasn't actually asking you to check it for me or to give me the information. So um, I'm exactly the same thing. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, I think in the long term, they'll be grateful. But right now, it's, it's one of those annoying things that mom does. Um, but for me, also, facts only tell you 
the reality as it is now. They don't tell you where things might go or, or what things could be like. And part of the enjoyment of writing fiction for me is not only being able to imagine a backstory, but also being able to imagine a resolution. And unfortunately, facts don't often give you a resolution. When you work with crime data a lot, you realize that mostly the outcome is not so great, mm -hmm. um, that the, the bad guys don't always get caught. And even if they do get caught, they don't always go to, to court or get sentenced or go to jail. Um, and that lots of, you know, people, I don't know whether it's good people or bad people, lots of people get hurt and are collateral damage along the way. Um, facts never help you resolve that. But in some way, writing a novel where you have strong but flawed characters who can, who are in a position to fix and challenge things, sort of, uh, it helps me even imagine, like, what could be solutions to these types of things? So it's, uh, it's not a literal solution, but it's a way of imagining that things could improve. Maybe. Uh, geography is, is really important in your novels. I mean, this book is set um, on a golf estate in Hartbeersport, um, on the Val River, at Park Station, in the tunnels under yeah. Park Station. So, I mean, for me, it's such a, a familiar thing um, as a Joe Berger to, to read a novel set uh, in, in these places, yet it's so foreign because generally in this country, crime fiction is set in Cape Town. Um, yeah. You know, it, it, is Joe Berger a character? A, geography is important in this book, right? It is. And for me, what I really enjoy and also don't like about so writing a crime story if you're going to get proper dark about it is quite uncomfortable you have to imagine the worst case scenario and sometimes you almost have to imagine yourself in that scenario what does it feel like um, to be threatened what does it feel like to pull a gun and want to shoot somebody so you have to really have a good imagination but also have a good factual premise and i remember when i wrote knucklebone knucklebone also takes quite common geographies and makes them scary. So it starts off in this really boring suburban house where there's a panic alarm, you know, that goes off in the middle of the night. And um, everybody who lives in the suburbs can relate to that. I mean, whether it's your own house or your neighbor, you hear that, you know, 3 a.m. Woo, woo, woo going and you wonder what it is. Now, if you've ever been in a situation where it's been your alarm and you really wonder what it is and you know it's not your dog or an accident, it's terrifying. Um, and I still remember the way I wrote Knucklebone. Um, Months and months later, uh, there was an alarm activation at my house. Uh, no, in fact, sorry, there was somebody jumped the fence at my neighbor's house and then jumped out and ran past. But we thought they might have jumped out through my property. And so the, the security company came and the guys came in. And it was, like I, it was like the scene I had written. It was so terrifyingly accurate. I, I didn't, you know, I mean, really, it was, I was terrified. And I was like, how did you write this so well three years ago? Because the guard came in, he cocked his gun. I was like, oh, my God, this is literally almost word for word as I'd written my scene. So, um, you know, in that sense, I was gratified that I was accurate, but it was also really horrible to be in that so, space. So is there a scene from Three Bodies that you would hate to come alive like that? Oh, my, all of them. All of them. I mean, there, there are some terrifying scenes there. But again, this, the point is, when you see your own house or your own garden at three in the morning with a spotlight on somewhere and shadows and you don't know what's in those shadows, that familiar and comfortable space suddenly becomes really threatening. And in three bodies, what we have is spaces that are so glossy and the veneer of them is so perfect. These golf estates at the Harder Beer Sport Dam, you know, with the, the golf course designed by Gary Play or Ernie Else or whatever, and everybody drives around in a little golf cart and it's idyllic and it's shut off from the rest of the world. Um, while this dam is being choked by these hyacinth plants, you know, or the Val, which is like this leisure boating place where people go to water ski and you go to have a liquor weekend at the Val and you go to have a braai. And these are not spaces where you want a dead body surfacing. So for me, this book is very much about that flip side of it's always there. There's always an underside to all of these things. Um, I mean, Park Station, literally, I've, I've been in those tunnels, but Park Station is pretty can be pretty, pretty good. Balmy. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> so I just want to remind people that we can't hear you, but you can send your questions through on the Q&A function at the bottom uh, or on the chat function. So if you click on the bottom where it says Q&A, you can send a question to Nahama and I'll ask it for you in the next couple of minutes. Um, just before we get there, Nahama, um, you know, obviously you and I both know it's, it's really easy to give cops a, a hard time, you know, to make them cliched, um, to paint them as, as keystone cops and 
incompetent. Um, and, and I get the sense that you try very hard to make a point of not doing that, particularly in this book, um, where, where Reshma is a, a particularly good cop. Um, and you, you paint the unit that she's in, in, in its various contexts and, and, and um, the various characters. Uh, that's obviously something that you, you take very importantly. So, as you said, I mean, I think I felt this way anyway, because when you research crime in this country, people like to paint cops as the problem. What's it, the tummy in, chest out, um, they want to yeah. criticize them, and there are cops who are corrupt, and there are cops who behave abominably and who abuse their power. But there are also a majority, I believe, who do not and who do a vocational job that is incredibly demanding and incredibly dangerous for very little money. And I think that, you know, to try and put yourselves in that position, I've learned this over the years through working on a lot of crime stories, but also through working with people who've worked on different parts of the justice system. And I remember talking to Glynis Breitenbach, who we both know, the, the shadow minister for justice. But when Glynis was a, a prosecutor, I mean, her description of the things that the cops would see now, I can't imagine what it must be like to confront the reality of petty and grand crime every single day, face to face. I only look at it through words on a page, really. I don't have to go and see the actual body or the perpetrator or take the complaint down. And cops are not enriching themselves for the most part. You know, so it really is this incredibly challenging job. And they are at risk. Cops get killed. Cops get mm. killed for their guns. They get targeted. Um, you know, when I was researching uh, my, my thesis, my PhD, um, I would not often, but, it, but more than once, find stories of police officers who had pursued murders for years, for five or six years, and just not given up. You know, and, and like this is some small station somewhere, okay? They're not, they're not the ones making the news headlines and doing whatever. And some cop had held onto this case and made sure that they found who was guilty of the murder. And that I, I found was, you know, we need to pay tribute to more of those yeah. kind of actions more often. 100%, you know, and I think that it's so easy to portray cops as, as yeah. bumbling and, and keystone. And I think you do a great job of, of not doing that in, in the book. Um, you mentioned obviously your research for your femicide book and you did this at the same time. Um, which I think is borderline insane, um, idiotic, but, you know, respect to you. Um, so you, I, I saw a quote this, this, is, said, this, is from, this is from the woman who, like, spends time with, like, gangsters in Bedford View. Yeah. We can compare notes on it. But I don't try and do my, like, doctoral thesis and write <laughs> two books at the same time. So you talk about how you, your academic work is about trying to get to grips with the why by understanding the how. My novels use the how as a metaphor for the why. So for 100 marks, explain. So when I started studying femicide from an academic perspective, I wanted to gather more data on the phenomenon because more information hopefully allows us to understand it better. Not only who commits femicide, but why, how, where, and also how does society understand the crime, um, which is where the media part comes into it. Um, and when we see how differently the media covers different victims and different crimes, that also lets us know who the media thinks is important in society. But like I said earlier, those facts, they don't sort of give me resolution. They, they don't, I can't, I don't sit there and, and, I mean, I've been working with violent crime data for more than a decade and I still cannot answer exactly why South Africa's rate of violent crime is so absurdly high. Uh, and none of the researchers that I work with have the answer to that. We have theories. So we can say apartheid did this and uh, the political violence did that. So we, we have these building blocks that allow us to come up with an idea of probably what caused it. But we can't explain why South Africa is so violent and other countries that have had similar types of violence didn't produce the same high levels of murder. And so you sit there with this frustration of why are we like this? Why is our society like this? And so in the novel, um, I, I'm allowed to explore those threads of why all of these different sort of intersecting things, the apartheid era criminal who is sitting there as like a property magnate living in a golf estate completely. And he will never be found guilty of the crimes that he committed and what it must be like on a day to day basis to confront the, like your parents killers, you know, and, and the fact that there is no such thing as justice, that sounds terrible. Um, but is that unfortunately true? For, for most people, there is no justice. And 
um, trying to explore all of those things, you can only do it in fiction. You, you can't uh, kind of explore the whys. Um, so it's not necessarily helping me resolve the, the ultimate question, but it does allow me to look at motive a lot more than academic work would allow me to do. Okay, I want to go through some of the Q&A questions that have been posted. And um, if you do have a question that is burning that you'd like Nahama to answer, you can post it at the bottom in the, the Q&A uh, section. Um, the first one um, is, <laughs> can we expect a thriller on lockdown and COVID-19 conspiracies at some stage? No. Um, <laughs> I feel the same so, way. It's the no, last I just, thing I want to write uh, about. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think I, I am doing some academic research into how the media is covering the pandemic at the moment, um, but I'm not going to focus on that from a fiction point of view. That said, I'm not sure what fiction is going to look like in the world after this pandemic. Do you think everything is going to be set in some well, dystopian so, like, like, pandemic okay, scene? The crowd scenes, any crowd scene that I've got anyway. How do our normal scenes, like these domestic these scenes that we have, change when everybody's wearing a mask? Or when you have to be two meters apart from everybody? I'm just saying the world is going to change. So I'm kind of like have to rethink everything that I've done before. It's a bit like becoming an alien species. So I think it will influence things, but I'm not personally going to write um, about COVID or conspiracy theories in particular. There's, there's good work already being done on that. Um, particularly in the fact-checking community about debunking the conspiracy theories. Okay, um, the next one is, you talk of plotting out your story. How do you plot? Do you use a chart, bin cards? <laughs> what's, your, what's your device? Is it all in your head? It is. Yeah, it it's, all, it's all in my head. It's terrible. Um, I, I know I should plot and I could have like one of those beautiful grand plot walls where you have like those lines, those string. murder walls. Your string. You, with yes. like, I, I actually want to do that. I do want to do that, but I'm so messy. And um, I just jumble everything around in my head. My head is like this giant washing machine um, where I've mixed all the colors. And so everything comes out pink, right? But um, it somehow works for me. Um, and I think that this is as a, um, as a learning and as a writing thing, you have to work out how your own head uh, functions. Um, everybody will have a different way of approaching things, pretty much like we have different ways of approaching finance. Some people need to write everything down to, you know, balance their accounts or whatever it is. Um, some people need to have very neat desks in order to work. My desk, which I'm not going to show you because it's behind my computer, is an absolute bomb. Um, but I know where to find things in it. And so for me, narratively, I can follow threads and I'll be like, oh, yes, I dropped that sock in the other bedroom. So it's a bit like a scavenger hunt in my own mind. But that's how I organize narrative and, and that's what works for me. And what I find from that is um, I tend to only go one step at a time. So I usually have an end in sight. Like I know what I think the end is going to be. I'm not really sure how I'm going to get from where I am to the end. And I let my characters take me through that chapter by chapter. Which is quite exciting. because It just sounds you know, terrifying to me. It really you know, sounds you know, terrifying. Well, you don't know what's happening next. So it's quite, I think it's quite exciting. I mean, it's like, do your own, it's a build your own adventure. <laughs> um, um, okay, so what other thriller authors have inspired your own writing? Um, okay, so Sarah Paretsky, who writes the V.I. Wachowski books. I have loved Sarah Paretsky's books forever, um, since I was much younger. And uh, I just, I love the strong female character that she's built um, there's a few and I'm going to forget some of the names, but I know that I was reading and rereading Sarah Paretsky's work again in the last year because she writes excellent thrillers um, and she has fantastic characters who are flawed but not annoying all the time. Um, I love Michael Connolly. Uh, that was, my, I think, my first, mm. the first way I really learned Los Angeles was from movies, of course, but from reading all of his Harry Bosch books. Um, and then the first time I went to LA, recognizing the way he described the spaces, it was, and I think that's it is if you can describe how a space feels instead of literally saying there's a palm tree six meters high, when you go to that place, you feel it. And it, it's, it's like, mm. whoa, I recognize it. And that's where books are magic. You know, books can really take you and, and help you travel. Um, so I buy everything new that Michael Connolly puts out. Sarah Paretsky has a new book coming out now, I think, which I'm quite excited about. I also like really uh, older thrillers. I like noir. So Raymond Chandler and Guy Marsh, um, Agatha Christie, um, you, you know, these are Sherlock Holmes. 
they were masters of crafting very, very tight social stories also, which I particularly liked, is they're not just about the crime, they're also about the kind of societies in which they take place. Um, so I've always liked those, um, those levels of thrillers. Um, there's a bunch of thrillers that I don't like, but I'm kind of, I'm not really going to go in here and diss anyone. Let's not go there. No, um, okay, okay. Here's a question that I know you're going to love. Um, and just yeah. for um, purposes of background, when uh, Nakhaba and I were in Nisna last month, the Nisna Literary Festival, and I, know, I had one in, day in off. Previous life, previous life. Yeah, before the apocalypse. Um, and I had one morning without my children, and she was like, do you want to come watch dogs train? Because that is exactly <laughs> what she would want to do, is go watch sniffer dogs. So the question is, can you talk about the sniffer dog in the book? Did you get to work with real police dogs when you did research? And go. Okay. No, I didn't work with real police dogs. I wish I could. They, um, so let, let me backtrack this several steps. Um, when I wrote Knucklebone, because there was a strong animal poaching uh, aspect, I um, got in contact with the Endangered Wildlife Trust. And in fact, just um, so that you know, I donated 10% um, of everything that I earned from Knucklebone, I donated to the Endangered Wildlife Trust. Personally, I did that. Uh, it's not a lot, and, you know, like... And you also books. donated the royalties from Three Bodies during so from lockdown, three, right? Yes. So all of the ebook sales of Three Bodies during lockdown, I've donated the, my royalties from that to a sex workers fund, which is to provide uh, financial support for sex workers who can't work during the pandemic. Um, so again, I think it's important that books have real issues and that you engage with them. Anyway, so I met with people from the Endangered Wildlife Trust when Knucklebone came out. And they told me one of their projects that they have is they, they train these sniffer dogs um, that work in particularly for wildlife poaching or anti-poaching. And so these dogs, they have the most amazing nose. They're trained to, to sniff out lion bones, um, pangolin, and uh, oh, abalone, and ammunition. Now you can actually train a dog to separately identify those things. It's radical. Um, and the dogs are super, super cute. They're very cute. If you like dogs, they're, um, I mean, they're vicious, some of them, but they're very cute. I wouldn't want to be on the wrong side. Of them. And they also do a really important job. And I follow a bunch of um, anti-poaching people and anti-poaching organizations and wildlife support organizations on Instagram. So sometimes I get to see the poaching dogs in action or there'll be photographs of them and being, you know, them being trained. Um, at the same time, uh, I then went and watched videos because I couldn't literally go to, to watch animals uh, being trained like this, but I watched videos of how they train dogs to sniff out ammunition. And this is interesting. You must because have spent hours down that rabbit hole watching videos I know, I'm, of I'm very of, good of at dogs. rabbit holes. I like <laughs> yeah. them. So, but they also have to be careful because, so like with drugs and stuff, the dogs have to be trained in a certain way because with drugs, you want the dogs to get in there, but not like in there. Okay, because you don't want them getting stoned or damaged from the drugs. And with explosives or ammunition, they have to be able to identify it without even touching the ammunition or the explosives, because obviously they could set the whole thing off. And so that also changes the way you reward the dog. So you, the dog has to be trained to uh, give its handler a special signal without getting completely bonkers. Whereas with a drug bust, like maybe they'd smell it and then you'd want them to get really excited. And that's how they'd show you different types of things that they find. And that was also where the, the dog who um, gets a reward gets a squeaky toy, right? And so in, down in the middle of Park Station, what I really love is that the sniffer dog in this case is not a giant, you know, Belgian shepherd or an Alsatian. It's a little Jack Russell. And, you know, terriers are excellent. And the Jack Russell goes and finds contraband underneath Park Station and gets rewarded with a squeaky toy, which is um, every dog's just happy moment. And then when we were in Neisner, um, I have a, a friend who is a dog trainer. And um, part of what she actually teaches the dogs is not necessarily to be police sniffer dogs, but dogs have incredibly sensitive noses. So she does the prep, uh, kind of preparatory training where you can teach a dog to find a treat um, without disturbing it. So you can also teach a dog, there's a treat inside a cup. And eventually when you get really good, which I'm not, and I can't train my dog to do anything, um, is um, you can teach a dog to even identify which cup the, the treat is in, but then the dog won't knock the cup over. Whereas like my dog would just be like full on into the cup, like, you know, cup on its head, treats sort of underneath or whatever it is. So, and again, it was kind of gratifying having researched the topic and then seeing how the training was done in Neisner. It was like, ha, huh, I was right. I got it like, right. Yeah, I got it right. <laughs> Lucky me, because if it was wrong, it would have been really embarrassing. Um, okay, there's a few more questions about process. 
Yes. Um, and if anybody else has questions, just um, post them on the Q&A. So the first one is, what is your writing process? Is it formalized? Um, or do you write when you're inspired, a certain amount of words per day? Also, do you have the story first and then build characters into the story? Or do you have the characters and they dictate or lead the story, which you sort of answered already. So is it leading with the characters or leading with the story? Okay. Um, so writing process, uh, this is now, Three Bodies is my eighth book or something like that. So I'm getting more used to the process of book writing. Um, keeping in mind, I started off as a journalist. So 25 years ago, I was writing stories that were three or 4,000 words because in the old days, we used to have long stories and then it became much smaller. So now it's kind of, you have to train yourself up. It's a bit like being a runner and learning how to run a marathon. So you don't learn how to run a marathon in one go. You have to start by running 5Ks, then 10 and so on. You, you get writing fit. That's what I call it. Exactly. So you do get writing fit. So I'm, I think, fairly writing fit, although lockdown has messed me up completely. But um, fairly writing fit in terms of knowing what it takes to write a book. So I'm able to sit down. Oh, the other thing with writing is you cannot wait for the muse. If you wait for the muse, you will never make your deadlines. I mean, it's great when the muse is there, but also sometimes you have to induce the muse appearing to your writing session. And the only way to induce the appearance of a writing muse is to write. It's like you have to okay. perform this. You have to sacrifice all the little words there. You have to go tick, 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 tick. And the more you do that, um, like the muse might eventually appear or not. And if not, you've got some kind of maybe less inspired words, but you've still got words on a page. So particularly with this book, this was, um, I had to write on a very short deadline in between finishing my thesis and finishing a book on femicide. So I really had to stick to the deadline. Um, and I just made sure that I set myself writing targets every day. So every day I'm going to write 5,000 words or 1,000 words, whatever it was, and that I stuck to those. And through that, I was able to build up from, you know, the first five or 10,000 words, which are always easy. Okay, anybody who tries to write a book, the first part, so lekker, because you sit there and you're like, ding, this is amazing. I've got like everything here, all my ideas are flowing. And then you're like, okay, I've written all my ideas out. Let's see where we are. And then you're like, oh, I've only written 10,000 words and I need to write another 70. How am I going to do that? So that is, it's discipline. Um, so um, in terms of uh, characters, um, I think I did say it's like a bit of a build your own adventure. So once I've hit a certain point in the story, I then stop writing for a moment and I'm like, what happens next? And I don't always know. And so sometimes there is a new character. Sometimes a character will respond to something, but the what happens next. And then I have to write what happens next once I've figured out mm. what it is. It's, yeah. um, tell us a little bit about uh, Reshma and Ian. Are they based on anyone you know? How did you shape them and how did you shape their relationship? So I tend to have a rule that the good characters in my book are not based on anyone that I know. I only base bad characters on people that I know. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <Evil>. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just joking. No, um, they're composites. And again, the way I work as a journalist is, or when you're a journalist, you often have to observe a lot about the world around you because that's what gives color to your story. Um, and I have spent so many years, whether it's sitting at the magistrate's court or sitting at Park Station or driving through town or everywhere if i see something i have like a mental snippets folder right and i file that sometimes and sometimes i'll take notes on my phone these days because my phone's always with me um and i save those little snippets to use to embroider a character or an idea later what a place smells like what the sunlight looks like at a certain time of the morning in winter or in summer um you know what the sounds are like in a space and then you save those and when you need them you've got this like big reservoir of kind of um, actual experience to draw on to sort of use it to to turn something an imagined place into a real place with Ian and Reshma it's a little bit like that where it's um, probably a little bit of myself because you can't really write a character without putting some of yourself into them but then also an imagined version of well who would I really like to be a great cop and real people that you know in certain ways who maybe they have verbal patterns or behaviors. Um, so they're a mishmash of everything. Um, and, and definitely not based on a real person because that would be bad. Um, obviously these cops have got, have got flawed characters. Uh, one of the questions here is, um, are they receiving any kind of therapy? So I don't think that the references necessarily are yeah. Ian or Reshma receiving therapy, but maybe cops in general. 
Poor. You know, cops can receive therapy, but um, mostly I don't think that they get as much therapy as they want. So let's just look at gender-based violence here for a moment because I do have data on that where we know that gender-based violence happens a huge amount within the police force, okay? So not even just people coming to lay charges about gender-based violence with the cops. We're talking about cops being violent to their partners mostly, okay? So intimate partner violence. Um, and that obviously is one of the byproducts of an incredibly stressful job that revolves a lot around violence and that includes ready access to firearms. But when you research kind of the history of particularly intimate partner violence within the police force, you'll see how the force itself or all the research papers about this describe the police force itself as being this like brotherhood, right? Where a, a large amount of violent behavior is tolerated, even accepted up to a point. And being open and vulnerable and probably doing things like therapy is not accepted so much, or it's kind of moved to the side. Um, I mean, there's horrific accounts of how this kind of violence would happen at police barracks in front of everybody else. So it's very much, it's not a don't ask, don't tell, but it really tends to shut down uh, any meaningful engagement about that. Mm. Um, so I'm sure therapy would be an answer or a solution, but I, it would require a massive cultural shift in the entire police force, um, which has got to come from somewhere else. You can't just put a Band-Aid on it and say, well, you know, life is terrible and everything's very violent and you've just lost a colleague and people are getting shot every day, but go and see the therapist and everything will be fine. You have to change the stuff that feeds into that beforehand. Mm. Um, so uh, just one more question from me and then I'll take one more from, from the Q&A. Um, obviously, uh, the realm of magic and supernatural feature very strongly in, in your books. Um, it's an excellent uh, plot device uh, as, as, as plot twists. Um, how important is it for you to get this accurate so it's not superficial? And what do you do to ensure that it's, it's accurate? Um, the good thing, I suppose, about magic is that accuracy is fairly broad because uh, there are different ways to, to include it. Um, what I try and do again is I try and make sure that I'm not inaccurate, all right, about certain things, and that also what I include is plausible. And the way I do this is, again, through research. Um, and I did quite a lot of research on the various aspects of magic that are included in this book. But the aspects of water magic were a lot less accessible to me than the kinds of magic that I discussed in Knucklebone, which was kind of involving animal parts and things like that, which was a lot more almost baseline level. And I was told in not very, not meanly, but I was pretty much told by the experts that I consulted with um, that this wasn't really my area to know about, that I wasn't kind of, um, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't allowed to know about this level of kind of magic. And I'm also cool with that because if you do believe in water spirits, they're very, very powerful and can be very dark. And they're the kind of thing that you don't really want them to notice you if you can avoid it. Like you don't really want to draw attention to yourself. Um, but I did with this book, as I've done with, as I did with Knucklebone, is I consulted, um, as I said, with several Isangoma um, throughout the course of writing and also made sure that they read my manuscript. Um, also to, to make sure that I wasn't using language that was offensive. It would be very easy for me as an outsider to mistakenly say something that I thought sounded okay, but really came across as completely wrong. Um, yeah, and to just make sure I was aiming for sort of plausibility. So I think that I've achieved that and I got good, good feedback and supportive feedback from the woman that I consulted with. Okay, just a, a last question from the Q&A here. Um, uh, you've answered a little bit of this, but what is your favorite kind of scene to write and what's the most difficult? What's the hardest? Um, oh, I hate sex scenes. I would just skip over them. Really, I'm so not interested in... I mean, and I, I like sex scenes. Because stuff. you know other people are going to read them or because they're hard to write or... They're hard to write. I mean, it's like, have you ever read that competition that they have every year for like the worst sex scenes, okay? You know, and you're like, you just imagine yourself as you're writing them, you know, he brushed his thumb over her velvet skin and you're like, Wah! I don't know. I have this like cringe thing. That just just like, let everyone fight. Just let everyone do martial arts. And exactly. Fight I'm like, they should just be fighting. And no one has sex. Fine. fine. And, but I mean, like Reshma and Ian, obviously they're having sex and they're going to like, and they cling to each other for emotional support. So like, it's hard. Um, and so I find that really challenging, which is, which is quite funny just to write it in that way. Um, yeah, so I would, I would just be happy if I could just say like dot, 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 sex scene, you know, imagine it for yourself kind of thing. Um, and, um, which is, and I said, which is ironic because I like sexy things, just not 
for me to write them. Okay. And, but, and then the stuff that I love, I love like the big action scenes, the, the, the ending scenes. I have so much fun writing those. I mean, they are so vivid for me. And I think that's also why, um, I know some people can write the end scenes first and then they like work their way back and have all sorts of things. I spend months imagining those end scenes, right? Like months. And eventually towards the end, it's like this race. It's kind of like getting towards dessert where it's like, okay, I just need to write the rest of this book. Cause I want to get to the good part that I've been building up to for all these weeks. And, and then you finally get there and then you get to write this out and it's kind of um, like, it's, and then I get to put into place all these things that I've been imagining. Um, over weeks and months. And I find that hugely fun. So the, the big action scenes in the book are my, my best fun to write. I love that. Just no, no sex scenes. There's a sex scene in here, right? There's at least two. Yeah. Gross. Gross. On that exciting note, um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Nahama, that was really fascinating. Um, I thank strongly you, recommend that you go and um, get yourself a copy of, of Three Bodies. Oh, look, double, triple <laughs> header. Um, <laughs> so, virtual and physical bookstores are now open. You can also get the book, on, the ebook, on Amazon Kindle and on Kobo. If you go into the chat function now, um, all the links are there for the ebooks. Also, um, if you're ordering lunch or dinner on Uber Eats, you can order a book as well. Um, Pan will post all of those links in the chat. Uh, you'll also get an email tomorrow with a link to the recording and all the details to buy your copy. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a really, it's fantastic escapism for, um, for this, this time when you just want to get away and not read about sex, but read about crime and about water mermaids in, in Heart of Beersport and tunnels on the park station and cash and transit heists. Thank you, Mandy. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.